You were truly a student, but not just a student, a scientist of <laughs> basketball. Like you really are. I have a PhD in basketball theory. <laughs> yeah, well, and I will call you Dr. Bernard King. Champions are made and cash always follows. But where did it all start? These are the true stories of the blockbuster sports deals that went down in the locker room, boardroom, and between the lines that made many people very, very wealthy. This is The Playbook. On this week with The Playbook, I have our first NBA Hall of Famer, one of my favorite players, and more importantly, one of my favorite people. This is probably one of the most intellectual basketball players I've ever met. Uh, and Bill Walton probably thinks he is, but you are superior to him. This is Bernard King, Hall of Fame basketball player. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Well, Bernard, for the few people or some of the young people who may not know about your career, I'd love for you to share with us, and I'll try not to interject too much, but just the on the court Bernard King, and then I'm gonna talk about transitioning to the great entrepreneur, author, speaker, uh, endorser, the Bernard King, the philanthropist as well. Well, I, I played in the NBA for 15 years, and um, it's a progression when you begin. Uh, I began in 1977 as a rookie with the New Jersey Nets, and what a lot of people don't understand is you have to invest in yourself, just like in any other business. And you have to invest in your career, and the, the way you go about doing that is you work on your game, and you look to improve by adding different elements to your game so that you'll become more effective on behalf of your ball club. And so I was very fortunate to uh, land in New York City. My, my home uh, wind up playing for the New York Knicks. Uh, and there's no greater feeling as a player than to play in Madison Square Garden, uh, particularly when you grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and you have all the New York fans there, you have all your friends, and you have your family. And that, that was the high point for me of my entire career, although I managed to play very well at an all-star level out in Golden State with the Warriors and with the Washington Bullets, now Wizards. But New York uh, really was the high point for me. Now, the interesting thing about your playing career is that a lot of guys with your athletic ability, you know, you have the size, the strength, the speed, uh, the jumping ability. But what really amazed me when I talked to you is that more than anyone else, you were truly a student, but not just a student, a scientist of basketball. <laughs> like you really are. And so, I, you know, I don't you, know if you, you know can give away like, all you your secrets. I, you know what I like to say? I, I have a PhD in basketball theory. <laughs> yeah, well, and I will call you Dr. Bernard King. I got Dr. J once, now we got Dr. King. The other Dr. King here, and we're actually in Atlanta, so that makes sense. No, I had a very studied approach to the game. They, they talk about analytics today. Yeah. Uh, well, I was very analytical as, as a player. I, I broke the game down into various different elements, into fractions, as I would call it. And when I looked at the floor, uh, whether it's in the half-court region, say from baseline to the top of the key, I looked at it as a grid. And I created moves based on that particular grid. On the left-hand side of the floor, there's a grid. And I had a replica set on the right-hand side of the floor. Then from the baseline, the front of the rim, to the top of the key and beyond, I had another set of moves. And so that grid comprised 22 spots. And you would never ever see me shoot from anywhere else other than one of those 22 spots. Obviously I had my kink spots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of course. that I preferred, but I, that's the zone I and operated And you practice in. from those spots and repetition and practice, perfect practice makes perfect play. And so you practice from those 22 spots, I assume. Oh, absolutely. And I yeah. try to recreate every situation that could potentially uh, happen in a ball game. For example, when you take a shot, oftentimes you're, you're bumped, right? Mm -hmm. And you're falling. So I would practice falling down in the gym on my own and releasing the ball because that's what's going to happen in, in, a, in a ball game. I would practice, uh, believe it or not, with my eyes closed. Yeah. If you're going up against a guy that's seven foot two, say at the Kembe Mutombo or Tree Rollins or Robert Parrish, you don't see the basket always. So if I can make the shot with my eyes closed and I have a defender on me that's seven foot or seven foot two, I'm still going to make the shot. It it doesn't matter who's defending me, whether they're a shorter guard or or a big man. That's incredible. Now, like anyone else, your career wasn't perfect. It may have ended with a you know, great legacy, but you know, some of the most challenging times of my life are the best times, and they really 
uh, you know, brought out the best character, th the best story for me. You know, my dad always said, you know, don't be a victim. You don't make excuses, make it your story. And so there's one story that you told me when we first met that uh -oh. amazes me. I don't know which one that is. It's about, <laughs> it's about the recovery. You, you actually ended your career, but it didn't, everyone else thought you ended your career, but you wouldn't allow it to happen. Can you t share that story with us? I was at the height of my um, career. If you can, can imagine being 28 years old, uh, the preceding season, I was voted most valuable player of an entire league by my peers. A lot of people forget that. <laughs> so I got to throw that in there. I like it. And, I, I thought you were a top 50 player of all time. See, that's how great I think you are. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I'm leading the league in scoring, averaging 32 points a game. Um, first team all pro. And it was the first year that I supplanted Dr. J as uh, on the first team all pro. And, and Dr. J was my standard. He was a standard bearer for my entire career. I was always chasing him, trying to, to excel at that level. And we're, we're playing in Kansas City. And now these LA Clippers. And I'm chasing um, Reggie Theus down. He's out on the fast break. It's a losing season because we lost three of our starters. And uh, I, I never give up on a play. And, and in that instance, when I plan it, much more aggressively than I ordinarily would, uh, attempting to go up to block the shot, uh, my entire knee uh, gave out. And it was and what year was akin this? to a blowout. And what year was this? That was in um, 1985. So knee surgeries were a little bit different in 1985? Oh, quite different, as you well know. Yeah. Uh, total open knee surgery. There, Beyond that, if you can imagine, uh, I have a book coming out that will detail my my life uh, and my career uh, in November, my memoir. Awesome. But if you can imagine being in the air, in the air, and you know your career is over. At 28. At 28. At the top of your game. Yes. And what were the doctors telling you? Well, like first thing I did very quickly is yeah. I called my attorney. I said, find the best orthopedic doctors in the nation, tell them who's involved, and ask them if they would consider flying to New York to examine me. Um, five doctors, four doctors did, uh, had one which was a team doctor, but four doctors did, and um, three of the four said, your career is over, and you need surgery just to walk properly again. Wow. So if you can imagine that, being told that. And um, I, I never thought of it in that way. Um, I, I, I made a decision on my flight back from Kansas City to New York to the hospital that regardless of what the doctors told me, that I would be back. I didn't care what they would think. Um, and and how you know how I convinced myself. I'm a kid from Brooklyn. Right. I grew up playing on the playgrounds of New York City, the blacktops. Yeah. If I can make it from there all the way to here, my heart will bring me back. And that's how I viewed it. So I asked each doctor um, that was remaining of the the two doctors remaining, do you believe your technique would bring me back to be an all-star again? I didn't ask them whether I would play again, again. Yeah, but to be an all-star again. And one of the two doctors said, well, I can't tell you that. The other doctor said, yes, I believe my, my technique will afford you that opportunity. I said, well, you got the job. <laughs> good choice. <laughs> and what did it take to actually come back and become an all-star? Well, I'm in the hospital 21 days, 41 metal staples running down my knee. And management came in, and, and, and this is what I said to management. I said, I want you to do two things. Put all the equipment in my home that's necessary. Send a physical therapist to my home every single day, and I guarantee you I'll be back. Now, they, they had the same conversation with the doctors that I did, right. so they had the same information. Including the team doctor. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, they did that. And physical therapists came in to see me, and... We ultimately uh, started working 21 days later at my home, and I, I couldn't move. I'm in a customized hospital bed. Uh, can't move my leg. My, my knee is bigger than my quadricep, if you can imagine that. And funny thing, though, I'm waiting for her to show up. I'm laying there in the bed, and two ducks landed in my backyard. Never had ducks before. And I'm watching them as they waddling up. You know how ducks move waddling up to my terrace door 
it started pecking at the glass. And I love nature. Anyone that knows me know, knows that I love nature. And I called for some bread. I, I finally worked myself into my wheelchair. And I rolled myself outside, and they didn't fly off. They just backed up. And I sat there very contentedly feeding them until my physical therapist arrived. I rolled myself in. We go to work, and we started with her just helping me lift my leg off the bed. That's where we began. And those ducks stayed there on my patio until dusk, and then they flew off. I figured that's the end of it. The next day? Exactly. Show up again to my terrace store, pecking at the glass as if to say, Bernard, come out. Do you know those ducks showed up every single day for three months with the same action, pecking at my glass and myself rolling myself out to feed them? The day that I was able to get out of my wheelchair and attempt to walk for the first time, it never came back. Wow. My guardian angels. I named them, too. Yeah. Aldo and Florence. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be Julius and somebody else. <laughs> Robert and Julius. That's great. Okay, so, you know, we, it, to me, that's what I love about sports. Guys, That it, it wasn't about the money. It was about the pursuit. Oh, I had a guaranteed contract. Right. So, and no. Enjoyment of the pursuit of your potential. You were a guy from the blacktop in Brooklyn that just enjoyed the pursuit of your potential, both athletically, but also strategically maximizing the statistical success of the game, figuring out not just how to athletically be superior, but you know where is that advantage going to come from? How can I look at this in a different way? I would say change the way you look at things, the things you look at change, and you really did change basketball and also you know you look at guys like adrian peterson that now can come back in weeks you know with yeah, the it was, surgeries it's a different different type of surgery today yeah. you know obviously you know a lot of people in life they doubt themselves and but beyond that they listen to the outside messages and they don't filter that they allow that to seep in and that's the becomes their belief system that no i can't do this i can't get that job i can't excel oh, at this cancel <laughs> and so each day you know what i did I took my right hand after each five hour workout each day with my physical therapist, and this is what I did. I patted myself on the back and I said, Way to go, Bernard. Way to go. Great job today. And that's what I did every single day for two years, working five hours a day, six days a week for two straight years to come back. I patted myself on the back. That's awesome. I, uh, I use gratitude in the same way when uh, I had a difficult time, you know, lost a lot of money in my life. And my wife said, you know, you know, are we going to be able to pull out of this? And she I went back and I said, there's four things that are going to pull us out. Gratitude, empathy, which is forgiveness, mm -hmm. accountability. Mm -hmm. I'm accountable for everything that I attracted and what am I supposed to learn sure. and effective communication. And she said, well, let's be grateful because it's already here. I said, what do you mean? She said, it's already here. I feel it. And just you need to be grateful. Don't worry about it. Don't create a shortage for it, right? You don't have that doubt. She said, the best thing to do is let's just be grateful because it's already here. And it came so fast as we rebounded. And it did for you, too. Um, now, there's always that moment of transition. You know, and for someone like you who's so intellectual, I imagine it's a little different when you transition into the business world. You know, a lot of people don't know, but you know, when you played basketball, there wasn't, you know, the, the 10th guy on the roster wasn't making $200 million or, you know, there's guys I don't even know their names anymore that make over a hundred million. Is it ridiculous? Isn't it ridiculous? Yeah, but you weren't making that kind of money. And so, you know, a lot of guys have to do things. You would have done it anyway, cause you enjoy it. But you know, what was that transition like when you, cause you truly are a, a businessman, an entrepreneur, you know, tell me what it's like to transition and what things you drew upon from your career on the court that you're now using off the court for the great success you're having. And I'm sure this book you're gonna have is gonna be a bestseller, so I can't wait to buy it. I'm on the, the waiting <laughs> list on Amazon, so I've already pre-bought pre one. You told me I went on my phone, I'm like, it's done. Uh, and please, everybody, do the same, because this book is gonna be incredible. If, uh, what, though, did you use to transition into all the different things that you're doing? Well, the same habits that I utilize to allow myself to be a successful athlete are the same tools and skill sets that, that you need in life. And my foundation of everything that I've done and, and will continue to do, I over-prepare 
to be prepared. Nice. That's, That's like my motto. Bobby Knight's kind of like that. Over prepared to be prepared. And when you do that, you'll always be prepared for any situation. Uh, I, I went into broadcasting, for example, uh, after my career ended. And I majored in communications in college, so it was an area that I always was interested in. And But there's trepidation. You're right. now on the other side of the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's quite different. And I've been fortunate that in, with that process I've won two Emmys I was part of three three others and so that was my mindset but when you go into a um, to a, to a boardroom when when you go in I was in the energy business for eight years on the energy company owned and operated and when before you go before the city council uh, you, you, you go before the commissioners of the Board of Education Bernard King does not matter Bernard King may open the door but what are you going to provide us? What are you going to give us? First quality service, first of all, that's what we're going to give. And then we're going to prove to you that what we have to offer is far superior to any other company you're going to work with. And so you go in, for example, in the area of energy, we were doing assessments. We'll, we'll go in and we'll tell you we can save 20% on your electrical costs. And it's proprietary, so I'm not going to tell you how. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but we'll, we'll go in for a period of three months. We'll install all our equipment, and we'll baseline everything based on where you're at right now. And we'll baseline that based on the temperature, based on what it was last year at the same point, and what your costs were at that same time. So we do a cost analysis. And then three months later, we'll come back, and we do a comparative of where you were last year and where you are now factoring in temperature and you have 25% savings. And so we'll go in and we'll actually uh, do the work before we, we get the contract. That's the same way you did in basketball. A couple more questions and then we're done. What do you see as the biggest mistake that young entrepreneurs or young players are making today? You know, there's nothing like age or experience to give us the wisdom we need. And, you know, I'd love to see what you see in perception. You know, what, what biggest mistake are these kids making today, whether they go into a profession off the court or on? My, my, my perspective is this. Don't ever believe you're better than you really think you are. And that's one of the common mistakes I, I see, not only in, in, in basketball, but in business. You think you're better than you really are. And if you start to allow yourself to believe that, then your performance and your work and what you deliverables, your deliverables are going to fail, ultimately, because you're believing that you're better than what you really are. And so when I prepare for something and I'm going to compete for a contract, I, I know I have competition. I believe I'm superior to that competition because of what we have to offer and all the work that we've done. But when I walk in that room, that belief is there. But when I do the prep work, I'm not as good. That's awesome. I, I tell people I have two words next to my nightstand and everybody knowing me says, oh, it's thank you. I said, actually, it's not. It's mm -hmm. radical humility. Because I, I believe that radical humility, as you state with young people, they don't know what they don't know. And it, at the worst times of my life, I lost my radical humility. Mm -hmm. You know, that I am powerless. You know, I'm, I'm a servant of, of everyone. And I, I'm here to provide value. And I'll get mine. But I need to focus on how to provide that value on being prepared or over-prepared, like you said. Um, and to that note, the last question I always ask is yes. my favorite, is what legacy does the great NBA All-Star Hall of Famer Bernard King want to leave behind? The legacy is my daughter. Ah, oh, perfect. My, my daughter, who's a freshman, just completed her freshman year in college at Spelman. It was much harder on you than it was on her. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> she knows far more than I do, even oh, at this point. God. Did you miss her? Well, no, because yeah. I'm glad that she's on campus nice. and she's getting an education, a higher, a higher degree of learning, yeah. and she wants to get involved in electrical engineering as well as technology, wow. and that's the space that she's moving in. And so that is my legacy, uh, my daughter, and what she's doing with her life. Not what I did in basketball. That was my job. Right. That's not who I am as a being. And that, that's, that is ultimately the legacy I think anyone should strive for. That's awesome. Well, now you know why this is number one in my playbook. 
This is Dave Meltzer with The Playbook. With Thank you for having me, Dave. Oh, you're the best. Hall of Famer Bernard King, thank you so much. Thank you. What's that number one thing in your playbook that you think carried over off the field? Well, I, I think relentless pursuit. Um, relentless pursuit is one that I think identifies off the field, on the field, and then into your personal life.